welcome everybody. It's nice to see you and uh, uh, and and a very very special welcome to my friend and teacher um, Roshi Grover Genro Gaunt. Uh, Genro is going to talk to us about uh, Zen peacemakers, but specifically uh, the Native American uh, bearing witness retreat that we've been doing for a number of years, and has really become a core activity within Zen Peacemakers and near and dear to so many people's hearts and their experience um, over the years. Um, so I'm, I'm just really delighted, Genro, that you made time for us, our little boulder Sangha. Uh, Genro's coming to us uh, outside of New York City. Um, and I, if you saw the newsletter Sunday, I, I did a little bit of a bio, but for those maybe who missed it just briefly. Genro has been practicing in White Plumas Sangha for over 50 years and and was really there at the very beginning of Zen Peacemakers. And uh, so uh, is, uh, you know, uh, really one of the keepers of the stories and the history and the heart and the wisdom and uh, and the experience of, of those many years. So um, you didn't come to listen to me talk. So I will... Um, and we'll, uh, just so everyone knows what we'll, we'll, what we'll do, Genro's going to talk as long as he wants and uh, until he runs out of stories. And uh, we'll save a little bit of time for Q&A. Seven o'clock we'll sit uh, until just before the end of the, uh, you know, the bottom of the hour. We'll do announcements and then we'll we'll end at 7.30 Colorado time. So, um, and with that, uh, my friend, thank you again, uh, Roshi, for being here. And I'll, I'll pass you the... Uh, talking stick, if, if you'd like. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Pleasure and honor to be with you all. So just tell me briefly, Jeff, this is, is, is everybody who we see on the screen from Boulder or from the general Colorado neighborhood? No? Most, most everybody is in and around Boulder. Uh, Linda is in, uh, let me get this right, you're in Rhode Island. I got it right that time. Um, and uh, we have, where did Mika go? Oh, we have two Mioshans on the screen. Mika Mioshan, uh, Genro, who you know already, uh, oh, who's part of our ZPI staff. She's she's a member of Eon Zen Center here in Boulder, but she lives in uh, uh, outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh -huh. That's okay. what it looks like in Phoenix there behind her. Yeah. It's really, it's really lush and cool. Quite a nice <laughs> view out the backyard there. <laughs> so so mostly is the answer to the question yeah okay great so good to be with you everybody uh thanks for joining and uh it's a big talk to topic we've got here um jeff asked me to speak a little bit about our native american bearing witness retreats and and the history of those. So the history is pretty interesting. Um, it all started with uh, Auschwitz, or Auschwitz Bearing Witness Retreat, which started in 1996, which was the first one. And they've been running every year uh, since then. And it was about the second or third year of this retreat that uh, it came to my mind and I was inspired to invite Native American uh, spiritual people to join us in this retreat because we had, every year we'd had Buddhist and uh, Christian and uh, Islamic, uh, uh, even Hindu people with us, Jewish, of course, always got a rabbi at this retreat. But it really struck me that it would be beautiful to have uh, indigenous people represented at this retreat. It never happened until that time. And I had been inspired <clears throat> through my life really by the Native American peoples and stories that I'd read and uh, 
various influences. But in 1982 or 1983, when I was still studying with my Zumi Roshi at uh, Zen Center of Los Angeles, one of the Sangha members asked me if I wanted to attend a sweat lodge. And I just said, yes, of course, I'd love to go. And so uh, I had my first sweat lodge experience with a Lakota elder from the Rosebud uh, Reservation in South Dakota, a man by the name of Ernie Peters, who was an elder, not a medicine man, but a spiritual man. And uh, he'd been running sweat lodges in East LA in a largely Latino uh, neighborhood. And it was, it was a big bearing witness experience for me the first time uh, to be with that group and do a sweat lodge. I loved it. I was, I was totally enraptured by it and moved. And I became very good friends with this uh, Rosebud elder. And we stayed in touch for many years. And I did many sweat lodges with them and did some trips with them to um, uh, the uh, Navajo Reservation in Arizona, uh, where we were supporting a, a, uh, a protest where the US government was trying to take over the southern portion of the, of the uh, reservation for military purposes. And it was a sheep herders area and they wanted to protect it. And somehow they managed to do that. Uh, on one trip, when we went there, we pulled off the side of the road. I had no idea why. And, and they pulled out quite an armament from the van that we were traveling in. And they did, they did uh, uh, target practice. I was like, whoa. This could get bad, but it didn't. And uh, it, was a, it was an amazing trip. In any event, so I had some connection with Native Americans. And I, I said to Bernie Glassman, I said, it'd be great if we could have a Native American spiritual elder with us on this retreat. He said, good. And so fortunately, Zen Peacemakers had a member uh, by the name of Michel Dubois from France who'd made a movie about the 1973 Wounded Knee incident on, uh, on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. So I got in touch with him. He was an old friend. And I said, who, do I, who would I talk to? And he said, he said call uh, Virgil Kilstrate. Uh, he's a, an elder of the tribe, an international representative for them around the world and for Native American people in general. He said, see what he says. So I called this elder and he was beautifully receptive. You know, I went right into what we were doing and what we were asking him to do, to come and be with us at Auschwitz for this bearing witness retreat. <clears throat> and uh, I didn't realize then that, that he was a man of very few words generally, isn't open to speaking to people outside of Native American uh, world. I mean, of course he, he had been, he'd been a, a uh, representative of the UN for years for Native American peoples, but he was incredibly open to me. And he said, I would love to do it, but I can't, I've got another commitment. So I'm gonna send somebody else. And I think this was maybe three months before the retreat actually happened. We'll say it was 1998. And uh, he asked a man by the name of Tuffy Sierra to come to Auschwitz and be with us. Tuffy was a former member of the goon squad during the, uh, Wounded Knee incident, if anybody knows anything about that. A uh, lot of bad reputation around the goons, actually, uh, that they didn't deserve. He was a professional bull rider for 
almost 30 years, unbelievable. It was national Native American champion uh, for several years. And he'd never been out of the country and he needed to get his passport. And he, and he got the passport on the day he was supposed to travel and he made it to Poland. And I met him there the first time. And uh, really wonderful, outgoing, talkative, warm man. And uh, he did prayers uh, at, at various places during our retreat and was really well um, liked and accepted and did his job beautifully. And it was, it was a real honor to have him with us. And it was a big experience for him uh, to be in Poland. Uh, one of his stories about going to Poland was his, his he was he was going through customs in Krakow and uh, they're going through his stuff and they see a, a peace pipe in his in his luggage, right? An eagle feather. And they said, What's this for? And he said, Well, I'm a medicine man. And he said, Okay, you just go through. They didn't want to, they didn't want to mess with him. <laughs> And so, uh, so we'd had this beautiful offering by the Pine Ridge Lakota tribe to be with us during our retreat. And it came to me several months later that, uh, that we needed to make a reciprocal offering. They'd done such a big thing. I mean, it was huge offering to send one of their people out of the country um, to be with us during a very important international retreat. So I called the Native American back, Virgil Kilstraight, and, and told him that. I said, you've made this huge offering to us. What can we do for you? How can we reciprocate? And he said, well, come on the ride. And when he was saying, and inviting me to do was to be on the Bigfoot ride, which is held every year uh, in December from the last two weeks of December, 14 days, starting on December 15th through December 29th when the Wounded Knee massacre happened. And uh, I couldn't say no. And uh, he said, great said, come stay with me and we'll do it. So this was gonna be my first exposure to any reservation, any Native American homeland. And uh, so I got my stuff together and flew in. I didn't do the whole ride. The, the ride at that point, we'll say it was 1999, probably had 200 riders all Native American um, that had been riding when I joined them around December 25th. They've been riding for 10, 10 days in open country in freezing weather, um, supported by their families, some support vehicles, but it had been a long, hard ride. <clears throat> and I had to come onto the reservation from uh, Rapid City and I had sort of Native American directions, you know, like go over this hill and make a right at the, at the oak tree and continue on down a few miles to Virgil's house. And I, I got to what I thought was his house and the people said, well, he doesn't live here, but, he, but his house is just down there. And I went to the house and his, and his wife answered the door, just a, it was just a trailer in the middle of wide expanse of country where he had his ranch and kept a lot of horses. And she said, no, he's not here. He's at the gym um, in Kyle, which was 20 minutes away from the house because that's where the riders are. So I joined, I found the gym and there were probably 300 Native Americans, mostly from the Pine Ridge and Cheyenne River Reservation where 
Sitting Bull was from and where uh, Bigfoot had taken off from in 1890 uh, after Sitting Bull had been killed to make that long, hard trip to uh, Pine Ridge Reservation to take refuge with Red Cloud and his people. And uh, the cavalry caught up with them on December 28th, surrounded them, disarmed them the next morning, and a gun went off. Uh, nobody knows quite how it happened, but more than 250, maybe 300 of Bigfoot's people, including Bigfoot, were massacred that day by the 7th Cavalry. Uh, huge, huge tragedy. And it was the last massacre and real uh, incident between the, the Native American peoples and the US Army in history. Enormously tragic. 29 people, 29 soldiers got the Congressional Medal of Honor for being involved in that massacre. And uh, the friends of ours are still fighting that uh, deeply. So I joined this huge group of, of uh, Lakota, Sioux, Native Americans in the gym. And I'm the only white man in this group. So it was riders and women and children, families. They were spending the night inside for the first time in the gym, just camping out on the floor. And they had a big meal. And, uh, and they just started to serve. Uh, just uh, smorgasbord style. So I got a plate and uh, looked around. And here's a place at the end of this long table. So I sit down. And this table was full of Native American cowboys who'd been on this ride for 10 or 11 days already. Um, rough looking group, hardy men, strong um, warrior type men. And when I sat down, the whole table became silent. Right. Here's a here's a Waisichu, which is their their name for white people, which means one who takes the fat who's sitting down at the table with us. So it's just deathly silent. And then finally, <clears throat> somebody says from down the table, where are you from? I said, New York. And you can see the, the shoulders of the, of the men just kind of moving up and down. They're laughing a little bit. There's a New Yorker you know, on the res. And uh, they said, uh, what are you doing here? Just confrontive, right? I said, well, I'm here to join the ride. Quiet, right? A little laughing. Somebody said, uh, ride much? And I said, well, yeah, I do. And he said, uh, got a horse. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to use one of Virgil's. And they all started laughing. For some reason, I'm, I'm still not sure quite what it was, but they probably thought he'd give me some rank horse that would be difficult to ride. but. The silence was broken, fortunately, we began to talk a little bit. I could eat, I could eat the meal. And then Virgil Kilstrade, who founded the ride in 1985, he had a dream that this should be done, inspired by spirits. And uh, he comes up and introduces and uh, just says hello, quick handshake, he, he runs off. And uh, the meal goes on for 20 minutes, half an hour. And 
Virgil asked a medicine man to give a talk about the ride and the spiritual uh, backbone of it, the nature of it. And uh, gives a beautiful talk, 10 minutes or so. And then Virgil, founder, elder, big chief, really, uh, position in the tribe, gives another talk about the spiritual nature of the ride, its history, its importance. Uh, another beautiful talk. Then it's silent for a minute and, and Virgil says, well, he says, we've got Grover God from the Zen Peacemakers here. Grover, why don't you come up and give us a talk? I was like, oh my God, this is like the dream you have, you know, when you're unprepared for a test and you've never studied and and suddenly here you are, you know, on stage. Well, it was it was uh, quite a shock that I was going to be addressing this huge group of Native Americans. And so I got up and uh, I told them why I joined and the his history of why I joined that this this Native American from Pine Ridge had joined us in Auschwitz and what the nature of bearing witness was just a little. And I said, the only thing I can really say, honestly, from my heart right now is, um, I really apologize for, for what happened and for the reason of this whole ride, for the, for the massacre that you wounded me. I said, I'm not a representative of the US government, but I know I speak on behalf of a lot of people that you know, are tremendously sorry and uh, sorrowful for what happened here. And I asked him to help me on the ride. That was my introduction to the, to the tribe. And I ended up riding for the next day and uh, <clears throat> had a really hard horse to work with. He wanted to buck me off and kick me. It was <laughs> not easy to control. But uh, amazing time, many, many stories. I was invited to a deep uh, healing ceremony called a Uweepi ceremony within those days. And uh, it was a pretty thorough, uh, deep introduction to the people in the tribe in a very short time. And uh, I mean, I had no idea how privileged I was to be able to experience that at that time. We finished the ride at Wounded Knee, their ceremonies, speeches, songs. And uh, Tuffy Sierra, who'd come to Auschwitz, came and introduced himself again and said, hi, you know, come with me. And he showed me all around the reservation. I stayed with him for a couple nights. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I was on the reservation for a week or so, something like that. So that was the beginning of my, my uh, relationship with, with the Lakota people. And Tuffy called me within a month after the time I was there. He said, do you want to do the, the uh, crazy horse ride? And this is another ride where they're commemorating a major event where crazy horse was killed at Fort Robinson in uh, northern northwestern nebraska and it was a ride of four days over 75 miles where they're commemorating the 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 trip that his relatives took burying his body back to the pine ridge reservation and and burying it so i did that ride unbelievable experience for four days camping in the open with the horses around us. I had several experiences like that. My relationship was not as a Zen student, teacher, um, message bearer. It was simply to be uh, a friend of the people, to learn as much as I possibly could, um, to learn their ways, to bear witness to their life, difficulties, enormous difficulties. And uh, 
I, I vowed at the beginning that I would never do anything that could have any uh, commercial benefit. I would never write about what I did. I didn't want to publish and, and uh, get any acclaim for any experiences that I had. And I had voluminous experiences. I was really privileged to be, I did, I sun danced several times. I was with medicine people in many ceremonies, um, adopted into families. Really, really amazing experience. And I was there on the reservation with them maybe a month to six weeks every year. I was there in uh, wintertime when the weather is horrid. If anybody knows North, North or South Dakota, just really difficult winters and uh, snow and blizzards. And, and I was also with them in the summer uh, for ceremonies, sun dances and uh, powwows, that kind of thing. I never really wanted to, to, uh, to initiate anything because they were so used to white people coming in, wanting to establish this program or that program uh, that would help them and uh, help them economically, physically, spiritually. Uh, I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be one of those people. So I was just a friend to the tribe. And my family grew and grew over that time. But one day, 15 years into my time with them, somebody called me and I was actually driving by the Wounded Knee Memorial in the center of the, of the uh, reservation. And they said, this is a Zen peacemaker said, you know, it'd be really great if we did a bearing witness event with, uh, with the Lakota people. What do you think? I said, well, let me see what, what, uh, what the people say. So I spoke to my friend Tapi Sierra, who I always stayed with. I stayed on his ranch, simple log cabin in the middle of a big wide open space a mile off the any kind of road and he said yeah that'd be great let's do it right so i said well i can't do anything without virgil kilstraight's uh approval so we called virgil and he said yeah i think it's time let's do something like that and so then i went to bernie glassman and he said sure he said try to put it together so this is uh, late 2014, early 2015. And we decided we wanted to do it in the middle of the Black Hills. Uh, we went to the Santee Sioux, which who, who are close to Flandreau, South Dakota, far Eastern side of South Dakota. And they had bought a, the first buyback of any land in the Black Hills by any of the Native American tribes. They bought a 300 acre piece, southern end of the Black Hills. And we asked them if they would make that available to us. Virgil was with us. He was famous among all the, all the reservations and tribes. And he made an amazing, beautiful presentation about what we would do. And he said, sure, you can use it. So we had the land and uh, we decided to put up big, huge tents for, uh, for our, uh, our meetings. We put out the invitation and the, uh, the uh, announcement of the retreat. And we, we thought we had a capacity of about 150. We had no idea what the response would be. We had something on the order of 165 people come to that first retreat from around the world. And uh, we had a huge range of, of Lakota speakers. Um, 
We did ceremonies, sunrise ceremonies in the morning. We did ceremonies in the evening. We had talks and we did uh, council practice every day uh, in an absolutely beautiful, incredible, isolated setting where they'd been doing sun dances for years there on this piece. It was, it was I think mid-July, late June, wildflowers were just blooming everywhere. It was just incredibly beautiful. And uh, that was our first retreat, our first Native American bearing witness retreat. And uh, really, really fortunately, quite beautiful, impactful. People really loved it. <clears throat> uh, it's such a uh, rare opportunity for Americans, non-Native Americans, to get the opportunity to meet Native Americans face to face. If you just drive on to a reservation, you know, you might get into the gas station or the store, but to really meet people and talk with them in an intimate way is extremely rare. The ongoing prejudice that the Native Americans still today in a big way experience from um, non-natives is, is huge and they're inherently distrustful, distrustful of uh, white people. And uh, it's not undeserved. I mean, they really are discriminated against in a big way. In, in most of their reservation uh, locations around the United States. There are about 350 reservations on the United States, in the United States. Of those, the Pine Ridge Reservation, where I, I still have most of my relationships in the Cheyenne River Reservation, to the north of that, where Sitting Bull was, uh, Pine Ridge was Red Cloud's territory. They're two of the largest. The largest is the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. And so we decided to do another, another big retreat the next year, put it all together, receive permission for the land again. And uh, we didn't get the, the uh, response that we had the year before. And so we canceled that retreat. But there is such an upwelling of desire from people to do something that uh, fortunately with the cooperation of a close friend, uh, Teokas and Ghost Horse, we put something together. And uh, we ended up doing a, a road trip that started in Rapid City, South Dakota and went all the way over to uh, the Little Bighorn. And we had uh, Native American elders with us who were uh, full blood, which is rare these days, native speakers from their birth, traditionally raised, um, who were our guides. And were just beautifully kind to us and open to us and told their stories. Uh, a lot of the stories that we hear, you know, come from ages old, but it was also important to hear their stories about what they're currently experiencing now uh, on the reservations. Uh, the poverty, the discrimination, the lack of employment on the Pine Ridge Reservation and the Cheyenne River Reservation, the Unemployment rate is about 90%, something like that. The, the, the quality of housing is miserable. The, the healthcare marginal, although it does exist and it's free. And uh, the social situation is rough. It's hard to find people that are uh, in stable families at all. 
So they shared those things with us. In addition to their traditions and their traditional life ways, which they're still maintaining, um, a deeply enlightening experience for everybody. I think we've had like 35 people with us on that retreat. Since then, the retreats have continued. So they started in 19, 19, 2015 and have continued up until this year. And uh, we did several road trips like that one where we ended up in, uh, uh, well, we, one of our destinations was the little bighorn, they called it greasy grass, but we've been to uh, Devil's Tower, which is in Wyoming, which they call uh, Mato Tipilo, Bears Home, Bears Tipi, to um, uh, Mato Paha, um, what's the name of that one, Jeff, Mato Paha? Butte, something. Bear, Bear, Bear Butte? Bear Butte, yeah, thanks. Bear Butte, it's another <clears throat> holy place. We've been doing our retreats around major holy places, primarily in the Black Hills, where there's enormous history of ceremony and tradition and, uh, and beauty. And last year, we were uh, at the Medicine Wheel in northern Wyoming in uh, what are the hills, Jeff, the, the big the horns, the big horns, big mountains. Yep. And we were there for a week, started the retreat with a uh, six hour ceremony at 9,600 feet at this place, which is called Medicine Wheel which as far as the Native Americans know, has always been there. It wasn't constructed, it was placed there by spiritual forces and uh, did a beautiful ceremony there and then ended up in beautiful redwood forests along rivers and streams and lakes in outdoor beautiful, uh, settings being instructed by our Native American elders, which include Manny and Renee Ironhawk, both traditional people from Cheyenne River uh, Reservation, Violet Catches, who's a medicine woman and uh, actually has a master's degree in languages as a teacher of many Native American languages, published author. And this year we had with us uh, Arvo Looking Horse, major chief of the uh, Lakota people, who's the keeper of the white, uh, white calf buffalo pipe, which is the original peace pipe given by uh, Pate Sawin, white buffalo calf woman, hundreds of years ago. Uh, he's the keeper of that very deep spiritual pipe from which all spirit, from which all um, peace pipes come from. He and his wife were with us for a day and a half uh, addressing us. And the teachings are always amazing, always beautiful. There's always conversation. We also had Wendell um, Yellow Bull with us from Pine Ridge, who's great, great grandson of Red Cloud. He's the keeper of their peace pipe that they used at the 1968 uh, treaty, the original treaty between the Lakota and the American government, which was broken in the next two years. Uh, he's an amazing, wonderful guy. He'll be with us this year too. So I've talked too long already. <laughs> um, we're putting together this year's retreat right now. Um, there'll be a meeting at the end of next week in Rapid City with uh, our Native American elders and spirit holders for this retreat. It'll go for three days. These meetings are deeply important because 
the relationships are deeply important and, uh, and beautiful. And so we've got time to spend together and chat together, eat together, pray together, that kind of thing. And we'll come up with what we'll be doing this year uh, in the Black Hills or on one of the reservations. We've got a couple alternatives. We're not sure what it is. So I don't want to even announce the potentials at the moment, but uh, we'll know in two weeks and eventually a uh, announcement will go out. And we hope y'all will be able to join us. So I'd like to open it up for questions. Anybody, anything, about anything. And if I can answer, I will. If I can't, I'll, I'll uh, try to get an answer later on. Anybody, anything? Curiosity? Please feel free just to unmute and ask if you have something. <clears throat> Two questions. Um, One at it, a time. <laughs> um, is is a you said you mentioned Navajo uh, Native Amer Americans here in Arizona. Um, do you have any relationship with those people so that I, I wouldn't have to go far? <laughs> oh, you know, uh, I do have relatives through other families I know that, that live there. Um, but my personal relationships with the tribe aren't, aren't great. Uh, it's been a long time. I, could have, I would have said yes 20 years ago, but now I can't say yes. But, uh, you know, if you Google Nav uh, Navajo tribe and something like retreats or um, uh, in-depth uh, experiences, something might pop up where you can just go to the Navajo reservation. Yeah, wow. So just, just look into it. <laughs> Another question. Okay, now, this is what, dealing with the Native American people, just like life, is a big unknown. You never know what's going to happen. And to to uh, get the best out of it, you got to take the plunge and make a big adventure, walk out of your comfort zone and, and uh, something will happen. <laughs> Thank you. My other question is, um, you've known um, your Native American family for over 20 years now. How has your rich experience informed or enrich your Zen practice? Oh, nice. Sure, nice question. Yeah. So, uh, I introduced my first Native American contact, Ms. Ernie Peters from uh, Rosebud Reservation to Maizumi Roshi. Uh, I don't know, 1984, 1985, something like that. And uh, they had a quiet meeting. And essentially, I was getting my Zumi Roshi's permission to continue my relationship. And, and he essentially said, of course, yeah, go ahead. Hi. So my experience with the uh, deep uh, intimate spirituality of the Lakota people uh, has been profound. And uh, I've, I've had the deep privilege of having close friends who are true medicine people. You don't study to be a medicine person, you're born to it. Other medicine people have visions that you're coming and that you will be in that position. And uh, they essentially have no choice about it. Medicine, a medicine person, we call them medicine men, medicine women. That's not the way their words in Lakota translate. 
the translation is more like uh, spiritual interpreter because they are listening to the spirits. So we call them spirits. We could call them angels, right? But they are real beings who are not in this plane and uh, work through certain people to guide them, uh, come into deep ceremonies. And when uh, the divine approves it, <clears throat> can heal people miraculously, I've seen it happen. Uh, they appear sometimes <clears throat> in, in forms of light, certainly sound. And uh, what's, what's striking about this spirituality is that the divine realms are present in a visible experiential way, which we don't get in our normal Western religious experience. And uh, rarely in our, in our Zen practice. <clears throat> unless we've got the big experience of light in a Kensho or Satori experience, which is possible, which does happen, but it's different. Um, I've been <clears throat> a devotional person all my life. And so uh, I had no problem uh, because I'd seen them and felt them uh, believing in this in the spiritual ways and uh, I've always had great faith but I think my faith uh, and trust in the realms that we can't see were greatly expanded certainly by my personal experiences with these uh, spiritual interpreters and in ceremony various ways many ways and and then of course I've been privileged. I could keep you on on the on on this call for hours, with 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 great stories of you know what happens in ceremonies and how the spirits work and and what their experiences are. But once 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 you've had deep, true spiritual experiences, your faith is unwaverable, and your trust in um, what realization and actualization might be are, are even further enforced because you know it's real. It's not an idea. It's not a philosophy. It's deeply experiential and, and true. Wonderful question, the ocean. Thank you. Wonderful answer. Anyone else have a I have one in my pocket, but I, 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 <laughs> I would just as soon, you know, not have to, anybody else has one? So let me just, I'm going to tell a quick story. So this ride, a, a spiritual story. So on this ride, the Bigfoot ride, <clears throat> probably in, in the original years, 1987, they knew because they had medicine people with them that the spirits had been, were always with them on the ride. Their spirits, when they say spirits, they know who they are. It's not some incorporeal person that they, don't, they can't identify. So Bigfoot will be with them or Sitting Bull will be with them. Crazy Horse will be with them. Names like that, deep old uh, medicine people will, will be with them. And, and they're always with them. In fact, for the medicine people, they just don't hear the spirits in ceremonies. They hear them all the time because they're always talking to them, saying, do this, do that. This person needs this, this person needs that. In any event, so one day in maybe 1987, let's say midway through the ride, there were some people who were sitting up on a ridge watching the riders come into their camping place. And they counted the riders. 
and uh, and then the next morning they did a ceremony before they rode out and, and the guys still on this ridge counted the riders again. And the numbers didn't add up. And so they, they talked to Virgil, they said, how many riders did you have? And Virgil said, I, I, there were like 190. And they said, well, we counted 350 coming into the camping place. And, and Virgil said, yeah, well, the spirits were riding with us. You know. So it happens big time. Wonderful. <laughs> so you had a question. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no. And if anyone else has uh, to go before. Instead of a hand, was it was there? Amy, Amy, Jonan, you had a question. Well, yes, thank you. I was uh, a little bit curious now that you've been doing this, uh, the relationship with the Zen peacemakers and, and going um, and having the bearing witness retreats there for several years. How have, how have you seen um, both the peacemakers kind of change or how has that relationship uh, transformed some of the peacemakers work in general and also then how do you as you're getting ready to plan the next one how do you continue to reflect on this work <laughs> hi so for me the the major impact of these retreats has been the relationships that people enter into with our Native American elders and presenters. And then therefore through their families and the tribe, the tribes themselves. So people who had no experience with Native Americans before now have intimate relations with, with these people who so generously give us their time and their energy and their stories and their uh, experiences and share them with us. And out of those relationships, things happen, projects happen, giving things happen. I mean, from one of our retreats, there was a really awful cold winter uh, in the Dakotas and somebody organized a coat drive and organized hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of coats, uh, winter coats from the Denver area, I believe it was, and shipped them up to uh, Pine Ridge and they were distributed at, at uh, family housing projects over a period of a couple of weeks. A lot of people who would have been, you know, more severely impacted had warm clothes they could use. There have been projects where Zen peacemakers and friends have supported projects for wood and um, propane to, to keep the people uh, warm through the winter. There have been projects, there have been social service projects on, on the reservations too, that we've done as part of our retreats. And uh, we always try to think of what might we able, be able to do in terms of service for these people as part of the retreats, sometimes there is an opportunity, other times there isn't, just time-wise or location-wise, but uh, it's all about relationship. It's all about continuing communication and relations with the people. That's the richest, that's the richest gift, actually. Thanks, Jonan. We have about a minute and a half, if anybody else has a short question or comment. Is that you, Sokyo? Hi. Hi, and thank you, Kinro, so much for the stories and sharing. Um, I was so struck and touched by the openness and the time of the development of your relationship with people, as well as um, their openness and generosity. I really, I can feel that, and I'm curious if there's anything you might share of, you know, in the development of those relationships and then the opening into a actual formal relationship with Zen peacemakers, 
if there are things that you've learned um, of, of missteps that, you know, folks may have taken or, um, you know, our, uh, our, our ways as white people of, you know, navigating the world from a, a different kind of view that sure. has, have come up in your experiences, that things that you've learned that others may be able to um, take in if they were to come to the retreat, for example, um, anything along the way that didn't go as well and, and things that might have been learned through that. I must say, thank goodness that there have been no huge missteps, right? But that came out of, you know, my comments during the talk about not wanting to to have some idea about what should come out of anything to only be open to only be responsive to only be uh, available and so once people found out that i was simply you know open and wanted to befriend the the people in the tribe they just opened completely right <clears throat> and families opened up and you know i was i was invited to uh funerals for instance i became i became the the prayer person even among the native american people i was doing they asked me to do funeral services for them pretty amazing Pretty amazing. I must say, one of the things that I learned deeply um, was silence is a good policy. That means that uh, not only in being with Native American people, but I think um, amongst ourselves, this could really work nicely, is that if we spend more time listening than speaking, the right things arise. So one of the things I noticed, I didn't, have, fortunately it didn't have to be pointed out to me, is that as I was, you know, when you're, when you're in, in the native countries, particularly in the, in the uh, wide open uh, West, on these huge reservations, everything takes an hour to get to at least, if not two. And so you drive forever. And as white people, we've got a cultural bias towards filling all the space with conversation. And, you know, if we don't have anything that is anything, you know, really uh, important for us, we might say something like, well, you know, uh, how old is this car, you know? And, Where'd you get it from? And just stupid stuff. We, you know, we're just gonna fill in the the quiet space. And I found out that if I just let the quiet space happen, uncomfortable as it may be in the beginning, that the topic that needs to be raised arises. Right? If you give the space, then what needs to be um, addressed, what needs to be spoken of, what needs to be shared intimately, just arises nicely. So the silence piece is don't interview people. That's the main thing, you know, don't interview people. They'll, they'll, they'll tell you everything if you don't interview them. If you interview them, you know, it's not gonna help. That's just a little piece. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I think we could probably talk for another half hour or longer very easily, but uh, um, but we we are scheduled to sit a few minutes ago. Uh, and and Genro, please uh, stay and sit with us if you'd like. And we realize you're two hours later as well. If you need to go, we 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 certainly respect that too. So. Um, so thank you, everybody. I am going to go. It's dinner. It's late dinner time for me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs>
So it's been a privilege to be with you. I'm sorry that I took up all the time talking, but I didn't get to hear your voices more. But hopefully we'll get that opportunity when you join us this year. Very much appreciate you being here, General. It's uh, wonderful to fill in. And thank you so much for your time. And enjoy your dinner tonight. <laughs> blessings, blessings, everybody. Thank you so much.